Welcome, this is the afternoon track of App Developer Con. My name is Carlos Santana. I'm a senior specialist SA with AWS. And we have here my co-speaker. What, Mijo? Meton Malik. And we're here to talk about mainly orchestration versus choreography patterns on uh, event-driven applications and um, instances in Kubernetes. We'll talk a little bit about resiliency and scalability. So I'll give it to Mithun to get it started. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. So let me start with the whole context around why you want to build event-driven architectures. What is the whole reason why we are here? And what problem does it solve? So some of the benefits of building event-driven architectures. Traditionally, we have built apps which use APIs, microservices, one of the uh, service, the front-end service calling a middle tier. It in turn calls another microservice using an API, and it fulfills a certain business functionality. But what it leads to is a lot of interconnectivity, a lot of dependencies, and a lot of uh, challenges with respect to maintenance and building, making more agile systems. So the goal of event-driven architecture is to make it more fault tolerant so that if one of the systems or microservices were to go down, you're still able to operate. It gives you that scalability since you're now trying to build uh, microservices which are connected with events. You're able to scale them independently without having to change everything that's, that's involved in it. You're able to have small systems and, uh, which are using asynchronous communication to connect each other. It is extensible because you're now able to bring in new functionality as you need, because you'll be using what we call as an event broker. And that event broker is the channel through which all these microservices are able to communicate using what is called as a publish subscribe type of a pattern. And it makes it more extensible because you, you, as your businesses evolve, you need to bring in new functionality. You simply connect them to that event broker without impacting any of the other pieces in your architecture. It gives you that agility because you're not dependent. So your, your teams can think more quickly. They can bring in new functionality uh, and they can build faster. So as I briefly mentioned, in an event-driven architecture, systems and development teams communicate via events. So unlike the uh, conventional API-driven way, where you're making an, uh, a REST API call, for example, here you basically use a middleware or an event broker to act as that intermediary through which the systems or microservices are able to communicate. Uh, as you can see here in the picture, you have the producer or the application which generates that event. An event is nothing but a state change. It basically indicates, uh, for example, an order has been placed, order has been canceled, a transaction has been placed, and so on. So anything that's, that's happened in the past you, that you cannot change. You can have another compensating event, but as such, you cannot go and change it. So that event is then uh, transmitted onto an event broker. And based on rules, you have subscribers which basically consume that event and uh, communicate with each other. As you can see here, the benefit here is that these consumers are able to connect with that event broker independently. And there is no direct dependency uh, with the producer. The only thing that it needs to be aware of is the schema for that event. So going further around choreography and orchestration, the, the whole idea of this talk was to take you through some of these patterns. So what, what does choreography and orchestration solve? So as you, most of you would uh, you know, know that in order to build something which is uh, customer facing, you need to have more than one microservice talking to each other. And this is where you need to have something like a orchestration or your choreography coming into play. As you can see here in this picture, the, we, are, we have an order that got created, but as part of that order creation, the backend needs to do multiple things. Right? It may need to do a pre-authorization on a credit card just to make sure that the, you know, uh, the customer has, has that uh, amount through his credit card or his other credit card, and then uh, we get a pre-authorization. Once that pre-authorization is done, then you actually make a, a call to the payment gateway to apply or deduct that kind of an amount. And finally, you go and apply the same transaction onto an accounting system for that particular business who's, who's the merchant for this. So all these typically would be in different microservices. 
Now, given that we're talking about uh, event-driven architecture and you want to make systems uh, as loosely coupled as possible, how do you achieve this? You obviously don't want to have like a two-phase commit or you don't want to uh, have a transaction which is spanning across all these microservices. You may have a situation where all these microservices may have a purpose-built database, right? So one of them may be using a relational database, the other one may be using uh, a, for example, a NoSQL database, and so on. So how do you achieve such a business functionality? You may also need to have ordering maintained that needs to be handled in, the, in a sequence. And these business requirements, requirements may evolve. So you don't want to be bringing in coupling between these microservices. This is exactly where the solution with a Saga pattern comes, play, it comes into picture. So as you can see here, the, what the Saga pattern does is it basically is a sequence of local transactions. So in other words, the first microservice, for example, may be doing a certain transaction, applying it onto a relational database, and then generating an event that we passed on to the second microservice. And the event of a failure, in the, those cases, you need to be able to have something called as a compensating transaction. So the picture, as you can see here, is showing that each local transaction updates the database, publishes a message or event to trigger the next local transaction, and then for error handling, you need to have similarly like a uh, reversing transaction, if you may, or compensating. So the two options for implementing Saga, the first one is called a choreography-based Saga. In the case of a choreography-based Saga, what happens is you have an event broker or a message broker, as we know uh, more commonly, and the microservices basically just independently publish and subscribe events as they need to. What it means is that when an event, when a, uh, event occurs, the first microservice may be putting it onto the bus or the event broker or the event bus, and then the other microservices may simply be subscribing to that event bus based on certain rules. For example, uh, when an order is created, you may have multiple microservices which may need to act uh, on, on that same event in different ways. One of them may be related to a financial aspect of it, meaning that it may go and update the customer's account. There may be one which may be just simply taking that event and put it in, putting it into a data lake. There will be one which may be more from an analytics point of view and, and identifying if there is some kind of a trend or some kind of an alert that needs to be generated because of some kind of a fraud kind of an event. So all these may just uh, go and subscribe to that same event broker based on certain filters or certain subscription criteria uh, of, of that event uh, based on the event attribute. Orchestration-based Saga, on the other hand, is the one where uh, you have a central orchestrator. So imagine the use cases where you basically need to execute them in a, in a certain sequence, and you want to control the order in which this happens. It also helps you with uh, visualizing that what are the different microservices that are, I'm calling, what happens if there's an exception, how many times do I need to retry, and you know, how do I log these errors? So if your requirements are more around that, then you typically would want to use what is called as an orchestration-based saga. So diving deeper, in the case of event choreography, as I briefly mentioned, that you have an event broker on which you have different microservices basically publishing and subscribing uh, uh, the events. There is no centralized logic as such, meaning that you can have new microservices or new publisher subscribers coming in and uh, subscribing to these events as they need to. Uh, the only thing that need to, they need to do is basically have that selection criteria for that event. This is mostly used for publishing events across business domains. So if you're coming from a domain-driven design point of view and you have gone through some of those concepts, you're likely to have seen how you uh, have different uh, business domains and how you create these uh, context maps and the dependencies between them. Now, as you start building microservices that are aligned to those domains, domains You'll, you'll realize that you need to have certain patterns on how you exchange events that are across these business domains and events that are within the same business domain. So in the event choreography typically is used when you, your one business domain is wants to generate an event that needs to be consumed by another business event. 
And in those cases, an event bus acts as the most scalable and the most flexible way to publish those events and have an event choreography. Event orchestration, on the other hand, involves a centralized event broker. And what the centralized event broker, as I said, is, is that if you use another service or another part or component in your architecture whose sole responsibility is to control the order in which these microservices are being executed. Most commonly, you will see that this pattern is used when you have microservices which are within the same domain. As I showed you in the other example, previous example for payment processing, uh, in, in case of an orchestration, and we will see it in a demo as well, uh, where once you get a certain event, you may have to go through multiple systems and look at multiple uh, flow, sort of, uh, components in your workflow before you generate a final event. And that is what orchestration allows you to do. It is easier to visualize, and you're able to control the order. And uh, it is typically used for orchestrating events within the business domain. So I, as I said, that across domains, you would typically want to use uh, choreography. But if you're trying to coordinate or rather orchestrate microservices within the same business domain, uh, orchestrator uh, or orchestration gives you that flexibility. If you're using an orchestrator, uh, you can not only use asynchronous communication, but also you can use synchronous API call as well. You have that flexibility. Uh, in AWS, we have a service called AWS Step Functions, which basically gives you that capability to have a cloud native service for orchestrating microservices. It works across over 200 microservices integrations that you have. Uh, you can invoke, for example, uh, a Kubernetes job. You can have a Lambda function being, being invoked, and you can orchestrate them together. So we have a demo for a managed care plan. So this basically uh, shows how a EDA is in practice or how it is used uh, in a real world scenario. So for example, in this case, I'm showing one domain, which is like a provider uh, management. So if folks are coming from healthcare background, uh, this may resonate uh, much better. Let's say you have a doctor or a nurse who's publishing their availability in terms of the services they provide. So you have this domain provider management where they're saying that uh, they publish their availability, that I'm available at this time. And then you have something called as a patient care plan. So think of it as like an app that you may have on your phone, for example. And you simply go there and say that, hey, I want to see a doctor. This is the specialty I have. This is the language that I want the, my provider to speak. And you know, this is the times that I, have, I would like to schedule it. As you can imagine, this can be in two different subsystems altogether. And it gives you a classic way of uh, building a system which is event-driven, or how events may be exchanged between the two to achieve a certain business functionality. So the architecture that we've used for that is all is based on Kubernetes. And uh, uh, it uses, uh, most of the components here are open source. Uh, we have, we use Spring Boot as the framework on which the core uh, functionality, business functionality is built for creating the APIs. And then we use Kafka uh, to act as that event bus through which these events are exchanged. And once, the, uh, once we publish those events and we need to create a workflow out of it, uh, we use Argo workflow for that. So as you see, as I dive deeper into this architecture, uh, there are different parts that we have around provider schedule, the care plan, and then uh, the, the part where I show the event choreography. This is where you have the, as the bookings are made, for the same booking, there may be different states. For example, uh, when, a, uh, when a provider says that, okay, I'm available at this time, you have the care plan which says, I have booked this particular slot for my appointment. Now the, the patient may decide that I want to cancel it because something else has come up. Once a patient does the cancellation, the state of that event now changes, but it's published on that same topic. So you see here what is called as a care plan bookings topic. And based on the attribute of that particular event, be it confirmed or canceled, you have different handlers. So this is how you basically implement what is called as like a choreography, where the events are being published on the same uh, topic or the same event bus, but based on the attributes 
on that particular event, you have different consumers which are uh, consuming it, processing it, and maybe submitting it back or sending it back on the same event bus. And then uh, if you dive deeper, uh, the other the use case where orchestrate, orchestration makes the most sense is basically when an event or a booking has been confirmed, you may want certain uh, uh, resources for that, for that booking. In, term, in other words, let's say this is at a, uh, at a clinic. You will want to schedule personnel for it. For example, the nurses, you may want to have a room booked for it. So, and those may be different uh, steps in a workflow. So this is where an event orchestrator comes in, and we use Argo workflow for that to execute the different steps uh, in that particular business processing. So for the demo, I'll just open up. I hope it's visible. So this the demo will walk you through some of the pieces of this particular solution that we have built. Uh, so this is, as I said, we used uh, data on EKS. So if you are familiar uh, with data on EKS, this is basically our EKS blueprints where we have uh, taken a lot of data uh, platforms and uh, show you how to run them on EKS. So uh, this is the Terraform scripts that you, uh, templates that you get with it. And as you can see here, the Kafka and the Argo workflows are the add-ons that we have used here uh, to deploy that uh, both Kafka as well as Argo workflow on uh, EKS. So this shows you the Kafka cluster. It uses that StreamZ operator uh, to deploy that. And then uh, we will, I'll show you next to the, the Argo workflow piece of it. So as you can see here, these are, this is the event bus uh, that's there. We use the default event bus, and then we use Kafka event source for it. And then the uh, workflow is the, is the uh, sensor that we have, which basically gets triggered. And uh, going through the code, this is basically the Spring Boot application that I was talking about, which shows that business functionality we have around booking and appointment. It uses a Postgres database uh, to store these bookings and the uh, availability of the providers. And these are the, the deployment artifacts that you have, as you can see here, uh, it's using uh, the, the same Docker images that we have for these different uh, components. All right. So next, uh, I actually show you how it, it exactly works. So as I mentioned here, this is where we are uh, invoking the API to uh, submit like an availability. So as you can see, the provider says that uh, he or she is available from this time to this time. The encounter type is on-site. What it means is that whether you're doing a virtual visit or in person. So this has now created uh, the availability for that provider. Now, if you go to the get all provider availability, you see the host URL has changed. What that means is that I'm invoking it on the care plan side to see the uh, availability that was just posted in the previous API call. Mind you, these are two different microservices that I showed you earlier. Now, uh, this is where I'm creating the, my availability, me, uh, sorry, my booking. So I take that availability ID and I say that I want to book an appointment. I'm waiting for confirmation. If you remember from the previous picture, it sends an event to get the confirmation from the provider side. Now, if I go and check the booking that I just made, whether it has been confirmed or not, you'll see that this is now showing as confirmed, and the payment mode is showing that you know it's an insurance uh, pay or, a, or versus a self-pay. Uh, similarly, as soon as the confirmation has happened, this is where our uh, Argo workflow will get invoked, uh, which basically shows the different steps post-confirmation for handling the resources in an actual provider setting. So once I take the token, go into my Argo workflow console, and this is where you see that uh, there is a uh, workflow that just got executed, the one uh, 50 seconds ago. Uh, just, uh, just come to it. There you go. So this is the one. 
and it then shows you the different steps. So for example, this is the input, this is the event that I just received with respect to confirmation. It's making a room reservation that is needed and then sending a confirmation to the patient saying that, hey, your booking has been confirmed and this is the clinic where you need to show up and so on. So with that, let's get into some of the deployment pieces of this and I will hand it over to Carlos. Thank you, Mithu. So switching hats in here, literally, so I'm going to switch this hat from developer. I have one here that says platform engineer. And is there's any, any platform engineers here? Yeah, app developer can rock. Okay, so two, two components that we talk in here, we mentioned data and EKS, but data and EKS is, is a, com we work with the community on data on Kubernetes. There's a working group, people from our team working there. It's how to run best, uh, how to run, the best way to run these stateful workloads in Kubernetes. Um, in AWS, for example, we have manage uh, MSK, Amazon MSK, we say manage Apache Kafka, where you say, give me a Kafka service and it gives you just the broker URL. So if you're familiar with, with Kafka, uh, basically that's the only thing that you worry about. When you are deploying Kafka on Kubernetes, there's different aspects of res resiliency um, and scalability you have to take into account. And one of them is when you deploy Kubernetes, you want to deploy in different failure domains. Um, in, in, in the cloud, you will have two availability zones, and these are like, uh, for example, different buildings, if it's on-premises and things like that. And the brokers and zookeeper, they need to be close to each other because there'll be a lot of communication between them and you want to have them in the same uh, availability zone and not, and not cross over. The other aspect is, Mitsu mentioned uh, the operator. So using an operator to deploy makes this uh, setup more scalable in terms of like scaling the configuration of them. Using StreamZ is very recommended to run Kafka, we use it in our, in our patterns. And the other aspect is having the consumers, right? The microservices that will consume from these uh, stateful workloads, right? Um, and these will be your producers and consumers. They could be in the same uh, cluster, but most likely you want them in a different cluster, but close to each other. So you don't have, you have low latency between them. Remember that these are like TCP connections when you're talking about Kafka, where you have producer producing in advance into Kafka topics and then consumers taking out those uh, messages that are sitting in partitions in the brokers. So that's basically, we have different patterns uh, there if you're running on, on EKS or data uh, on Kubernetes, there are different patterns, but at least for us, we have a project called the EKS Blueprints where you can deploy um, a Kafka and then get it up and running. And we have helped a lot of users and users running Kafka efficiently on, on Kubernetes. So that's a few of the tips of running Kafka in production. If you have run Kafka in production, it takes more than that, but at the high level, this is a good, good starting point of what will be the aspects of when you get, you get started deploying uh, Kafka and Kubernetes. The second one is uh, Argo workflows, but uh, like we in the demo, we mentioned Argo events, and usually they go together because that's the event source for um, Argo workflows and Argo events has a sensor uh, for Argo workflow. Basically, it, it instantiates a workflow. So in terms of um, uh, scalability and you know scaling these uh, Argo events, we're talking about Argo events, uh, there's two aspects on it. It's the event source, which in our, in our demo was Kafka, but it can be like GitHub, a, a GitHub uh, pull request event, like those, some type of events, and there's a couple of them there. They scale uh, by deployment, so there's not that much problems of scaling them. It's just you have a lot of deployments or pods handling. The, the one that will be your bottleneck or what you need to uh, be more concerned about is using the event bus. And in Argo workflow, in Argo events, uh, there's one that is um, the one that, that we use in the demo, which is um, using NAT, uh, is the na we call it the native. There's also jet streams, which is the next best one uh, from that. And then you have, not saying that it's the best one, but then we have folks using Kafka because they are using Kafka anyway. So they want to reuse Kafka for the event bus. And that's, that will be uh, one way of ga gaining that scalability resiliency from Kafka that you already deployed with StreamZ. 
when it comes to Argo workflow, Argo workflow where you have to watch out for uh, scalability is the Argo workflow controller. The Argo workflow controller, the way it works, it creates, uh, when you create an Argo workflow, that's an instance of a, of a running job, you can say. And then any status that is on that, on that workflow or in, in outputs or uh, inputs or outputs are safe on the CR. So you're writing back to the etcd, and as you get, you get 1,000, 2,000, like that many CRs, it, the Argo workflow, uh, the Argo workflow controller has scalability problems. So you start, need to start sharding manually um, on which workflows match to each controller, and you can have multiple controllers. But we started a SIG in Argo called the SIG scalability between <laughs> um, we have a SIG scalability where we are looking into helping writing the control of Argo, uh, scaling Argo CD and Argo, and, and Argo uh, workflows. And to finish, um, as Argo workflows can run uh, jobs in parallel on Diags, the number of workflows that you run in parallel at the same time basically is uh, how many pods you can run on an EKS cluster, and it has garbage collection into it. Um, in terms of scaling Argo workflows, you have to take into account the, type, the different type of storage. So you, if you have uh, ephemeral kind of storage, you go at the bottom, like using SSD, the local storage of the node, uh, where you have more resiliency and um, uh, more uh, better data uh, for resiliency, it will be S3. And then between them, there's different aspects of what storage do you use. That will be also affecting your scalability of Argo workflows. And with that, uh, we want to say, uh, give it a try. This is the URL for the example. Out of the box, you can, if you're a platform engineer, you may know Terraform, you can do Terraform apply. And it deploys, you can use things like the GitOps bridge if you want to deploy the Helm chart. And all these and all the patterns are under the data on EKS where we have patterns for Jupyter Hub, Spark, Ray, all these stateful workloads to run in Kubernetes. They're kind of like, um, complex to run, but we have a pattern in there that people are, are, are using and sharing and open pull requests. It's an open source project, the data on EKS. So with that, I think we're done. Thank you so much.